The campaign team asked me to talk about what I learned about liberation from black revolutionaries over the years. And for me, it really started 1964 when I'm in California and I'm watching Ronald Reagan campaign against the fair housing law that just passed on behalf of the Republicans for a referendum to get it repealed. And I came up in a Republican family and they said one of the things Republicans stood for it was civil rights, but Reagan was making clear that was not the case. So the Democrats had a choice at Atlantic City at their convention to seat the Mississippi Freedom Democrats that the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and Freedom Summer had organized an integrated slate that actually followed the rules of the National Democratic Party or the old regulars from the Dixiecrats, the all white segregationist delegation. And Johnson decided to keep the South in his corner because he's being challenged by Goldwater who was mobilizing the white backlash that he was going to seat the Dixiecrats, the segregationists. So I'm sitting here saying, well, where's my party? And I, be, I came into contact with, you know, SNCC basically indirectly because, you know, the, the media and people like Reagan would say, oh, they're communists. And these uh, young men that were our city uh, rec directors, you know, they supervised us at, at the uh, community center when we played basketball and whatnot. They said, no, these are civil rights workers. They just got back from Mississippi. These are the people that organized the free speech movement in Berkeley. And that was about the right to organize on campus to go out and desegregate parts of the San Francisco Bay Area where restaurants and whatnot were segregated. And that's what that fight was all about. So, you know, I became very aware of that. And one of the things that really struck me was, as I learned more about what happened in Atlantic City, you know, the middle class leadership, including Martin Luther King, Bayard Rustin, A. Philip Randolph, who the year before had organized the March on Washington, which had a big impact, were telling the Freedom Democrats, accept Johnson's offer. You get two token seats, it's progress, and we'll make more progress in the future. And Fannie Lou Hamer, a sharecropper, who was one of the co-chairs of the delegation, because one of the things that SNCC did was everybody thought Bob Moses, this Harvard mathematician, who was the lead organizer would be, you know, leading the Freedom Democrats. He said, no, this is for Mississippi folks and you're gonna elect your leadership. And one of the people they chose was Fannie Lou Hamer. And she persuaded the delegation that they didn't come all this way and do all they, they went through, getting beat up and fighting for the right to vote and organizing the whole party, going through the whole process, electing their delegates to get denied. So she said we should reject, and she persuaded the delegation to reject that. And that summed up something I later learned that the uh, African revolutionary in Guinea-Bissau, Amakar Cabral said. He said, tell no lies, claim no easy victories. You can't fool yourself. You can't call defeats victories. You got to be realistic about the current situation. So that was one of the things that the civil rights movement you know, with all they did from the Montgomery bus boycott and all the fights for civil rights, the confrontation with the Democratic Party in Atlantic City in 1964, they inspired all the movements that came out of the 60s, the women's liberation movement, the gay liberation movement, the anti-war movement, the ecology movement. So that's another thing I learned that a movement that has integrity and really fights for what it wants will inspire people who may not be directly affected by its concerns. Uh, and so I think that's one of the things I learned that uh, you, you have a movement that's principled and sticks by its guns. It's gonna inspire other people to do the same thing and fight for what's right. So another thing going on at that time, which I learned about later when I read Malcolm X's biography and started reading his speeches was first of all, this man, was so clear and sharp in his analysis. And I've talked to people that heard him speak in New York City, and they said they've never heard anybody that would, and he could speak to an audience. He could read an audience, if it was all black or it was a mixed audience or even white folks. 
He would know how to read them to get his points across without compromise very clearly so people had to deal with it. And what I thought and, and I began to realize over the years he brought was not just an analysis of racism, but of how racism was part of an international system of colonialism and imperialism and that it had a class dimension. That just because somebody was black didn't mean they were for black liberation because the system could co opt people into being administrators of the system and getting rewarded for that. And so I'm going to talk about a speech Malcolm gave later when I talk about somebody else that influenced me. But he brought that class and race analysis, which also the year before 64, and I learned much more about this later, the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. They had an economic bill of rights. And their analysis, and when I say they, I'm talking about A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, Martin Luther King was part of that. And they, Rustin and Randolph were leaders of the Socialist Party, which was a small party at that time, just a few thousand people. And they had a youth group, the Young People's Socialist League, the Ypsils. That's where Bernie Sanders got involved in politics in Chicago, uh, civil rights politics in the 60s. And their analysis was to defeat this white backlash, which Goldwater was mobilizing as he ran for president, and the Dixiecrats were mobilizing and become manifest in George Wallace's campaigns in 68 and 72, you've got to have a program that appeals to the white working class too, to undermine the material basis for them getting mobilized around racist scapegoating as if it was black people, not white employers that were exploiting them. And to undermine this, what Du Bois called the, the, the psychological wages of white supremacy. You may be dirt poor, but at least you're not black. That's what white people were told. And so they tried to put forward a program that could also appeal beyond just the black community at the March on Washington. And they turned that into a freedom budget for all Americans. In 1966, they submitted to Congress. And there's a book called The Freedom Budget for All Americans by Paul LeBlanc and Michael Yates which explains the thinking of Randolph and Rustin and the Yipsels about this race and class analysis and why they needed to put forward this economic bill of rights to undermine the material basis of racism in this country. And because we didn't do it back then and get this economic bill of rights, the white backlash got into the White House. Johnson kind of expressed that, Nixon clearly did, Reagan did. I mean, he announced his campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi, right where uh, Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner were murdered as civil rights workers. And of course, with Donald Trump, you know, the white black guys took over the White House. And Trump was able to mobilize a lot of middle class and working class white people who feel that it's not corporations that move their jobs overseas, it's immigrants or something like that. And, you know, that's why this program was so important. And because we didn't get in the 60s, we're in the situation we are now where the Republican Party is like the old Democratic Party that took over the Reconstruction governments, violently overthrew them back after the Civil War with the slogan of, they were very upfront about it, white supremacy, that was their slogan. And here we are, they're a little bit more subtle now, but that's what the Republican Party is about today. So. The other thing that happened in that period was while Randolph and Rustin were silent about the escalation in Vietnam, King became very clear that we're losing the war on poverty and the war in Vietnam. And we can't get the freedom budget through Congress because they got to spend money on this stupid war. And he came out against the war. And that was one of the demands of the Poor People's Campaign, along with the Economic Bill of Rights. So that was another thing that I learned that you know, the international question, imperialism, uh, cannot be divorced from dealing with domestic racism and uh, poverty. And then the other thing they were doing in the Poor People's Campaign, which was a logical conclusion of what they're talking about in 1963 with the March on Washington, was King wanted to mobilize not just black folks, but poor white folks, 
poor Mexicans, American Indians in a <clears throat> what later became Fred Hampton called a rainbow coalition. And that was something that I saw in the Bay Area coming up with the Black Panther Party. They were organizing black people, but they saw themselves as part of a larger movement and they were trying to provide direction uh, of the kind of organizing we needed to do at the grassroots. And, you know, a lot of people know about Bobby Seale and Fred Hampton, I mean, uh, uh, Huey Newton following the Oakland cops around with a law book and a shotgun, which they had the right to do to make sure that people being stopped by the police weren't mistreated. And that got a lot of attention, but what won the hearts and minds of the black community in Oakland was when in northern North Oakland, there was an elementary school called Salem Elementary. And there was an avenue going by there. There was no stoplight. And kids kept getting hit by cars. And the community had wanted a stoplight there. And the city council was not responsive. So the Panthers went out there with, you know, rifles slung over the shoulder and started directing the traffic. And, man, city council was, they had that stoplight pretty quick. And the cops were shown up. And the community said, hey, the Panthers can get things done. And that was the beginning of all those uh, social programs that they were involved in, sickle cell anemia, free breakfast, uh, escorting seniors when they got their checks cashed to the grocery store so they didn't get mugged on the way in or out. Um, all these programs were not things that the Panthers thought of, you know, in their central committee meeting. They had a storefront and people would come in and say, Here's the issues we got. And then the Panthers tried to respond. That's another lesson. You got to listen to the people to get direction as to how you organize. And uh, of course, in Chicago, Fred Hampton, you know, took that to another level. He, uh, you know, went out and made alliances with the, uh, the young lords or the Brown Berets, I forget which in the Mexican community would have been the, the Brown Berets. And, uh, the Young Patriots, which were basically Appalachian whites who'd been displaced down in Appalachia and were up in Chicago and facing similar problems as the black community in terms of dealing with slumlords and uh, discrimination in employment from, you know, just from the neighborhoods these people were coming from. And so he was building, he called it the Rainbow Coalition. And, you know, he did some other remarkable organizing. He got the big street gangs, the big three. LSD, the LSD Coalition, Lords, Stones, and Disciples, Vice Lords on the West Side, uh, Black Disciples on the South Side, and Blackstone Rangers on the South Side, and organized them to like picket construction sites where Black people weren't being hired, and uh, a lot of remarkable organizing going on, but the lesson there is uh, you got to build a broad coalition of the exploited and oppressed to win your demands. And I think the Panthers exemplified that. And then the other revolutionaries that I, I did have direct contact with and discussions with were uh, Jimmy or James Boggs and Grace Lee Boggs in Detroit. And they, they were protégés of CLR James, the Trinidadian Marxist who wrote a lot of great books like the Black Jacobins about the Haitian Revolution, where the slaves threw the the slave the slave owners out, and they formed a republic. Um, they were elder advisors to SNCC activists, and later the League of Black Revolutionary Workers in Detroit. And back in the early '60s, they organized uh, what became one of Malcolm X's most famous speeches, "The Message to the Grassroots," where he drew the distinction between what he called the Black Revolution and the Negro Revolution. The Black Revolution was about fundamental change to the system. The Negro Revolution was about just getting some Black folks into the existing system without changing the underlying structures that were keeping the masses poor. And he, he used what became something that a lot of people used for a long time, the difference between what he called the field Negro and the house Negro. So. The field Negro, like Fannie Lou Hamer, the sharecropper, she had nothing to lose. Uh, whereas some of those middle-class uh, advisors back in 64 were telling her to take the compromise and they had something to lose. So, you know, Malcolm, that's part of the class analysis that he brought in. 
So the bogs were right in the middle of all this movement. And, you know, a couple of things that, you know, Jimmy in particular uh, gave me as advice that, that I've taken to heart. One is when you relate to black political formations or black activists, you got to be critical because there are a lot of people using that as a cover for their own effort to get a piece of the action, as Jimmy would put it. And uh, so you've got to basically be, uh, you got to be principled and, and expect people to be principled with you and have honest discussions. And if people aren't willing to have those discussions, they're probably not going to be reliable allies. And, uh, you know, you got to look for the people that really want to change the system to end the oppression and exploitation. So those are some of the lessons I've learned from uh, directly and indirectly interacting with some of these black revolutionaries. And I hope uh, people found that edifying and helpful. I mean, it was in the chat that somebody felt like you should be a professor of history and, you know, uh, Rose let them know you are a professor. You know, you, you are a teacher of the masses. But I mean, like, how dope is it? Like, this is not some abstract thing that you read in a book. This is what you're sharing. This is your life. This is like lived experience. Is and I'm it's something a lot of people, my generation, the radicals picked up from the same sources. And you know, the, the initial impetus was the civil rights or black freedom movement uh, in the South, which you know changed a whole lot of things in this country. 